First, I want to thank our panelists for taking time out of their days uh, to be uh, part of our Mechanical Engineering Career Exploration Night panel. Um, this event is being recorded and will be made available to your AOC 101 instructors in a few days. In case you become closed out of the meeting, please log in again. We have panelists from 4.30 to 5.30, followed by a brief break. Then we will switch out the panelists for another uh, set of panelists from 5.30 to 6.30. As the moderator, I will start with prepared questions directed to some or all of our panelists. Um, panelists, I will use your name so you know the question is being directed towards you. If you would like to pass on answering the question, please feel free to say pass. And um, uh, feel free to also add or agree with someone else's comment. Students, your attendance is being recorded based on your registration information and length in the meeting. The, this attendance will be given uh, to your ASU 101 instructor. Please use the Q&A box on the black Zoom bar to type career-related questions for our panelists. You can make up questions or use the questions from your workbook. If the question is directed to a specific panelist, please include their name in the question. Please feel free to type your questions now. Our Q&A moderator will read them shortly. All right, panelists, please feel free to take yourself off mute, and uh, but please remain off video. We will go ahead and get started. So the first question is for all of our panelists. To help the undergraduate first year student audience know a bit more um, about you as they formulate their questions, please give your minute to two minute professional tell me about yourself pitch, including how your formal education is used in your current or previous role. Um, let's go ahead and start with Pam. Hey, good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Um, my career was pretty unconventional, but I had a lot of fun. I started out with a bachelor's degree in astrophysics. Then I got a master's in combined radio astronomy and microwave engineering. I then had a seven year career in microwave engineering, first working with component design and then system design for radar and satellite communications. And I'm sure you're wondering how this evolves into a mechanical, but I took a sideways move into technical writing while raising a family and taking care of my mom. And that gave me the chance to learn about uh, many different topics, writing for magazines. And it just turned out that it, I felt everything I learned in school at some point became relevant, whether it was programming I did or statistics or mechanical labs in which I built something. So it was very cool to see things tie back in. Then I found that the topic I liked writing about the most was something that didn't exist when I was in college, and that was the field of 3D printing. So when I ended up getting a job as a 3D printing application engineer, again, I have found that I'm always reaching back to something that I learned before on one of my other jobs. So you may not know how relevant something's going to be, but you kind of file it in the back of your head, and there's always a way that it becomes important. So that's me. Thank you. Weston? Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Weston Alvarez. Um, I started my engineering career at ASU. Um, started as a mechanical engineer, and I always had a kind of passion for tinkering and building things when I was younger. So that's kind of what led me there. And I enjoyed uh, 3D modeling the most of all. So I took that class uh, or in supplementary courses as often as I could. That's kind of the main thing I do now at Boeing. Um, I am a uh, design engineer. So I w get to use CAD to model up uh, various parts and assemblies. Um, as far as the kind of courses and stuff that kind of got me through this it a lot of the uh, programming courses that I actually thought were maybe not so relevant became relevant um, or at least became a useful tool to kind of bypass some of the difficulties of just standard engineering so 
while I didn't think the uh, kind of programming side would apply to me as a mechanical engineer, it definitely played a big role in what I was capable of doing as an engineer. Fantastic, thank you. Jamie? Hello, thanks everyone for joining in. Uh, so I have a bit of, I also went to ASU like Weston uh, for mechanical engineering and I've had a bit of a variety of a background. So um, like Weston, when I was going to school, I was really in love with 3D modeling. So I took that class as much as I could. And I, what really brought me to engineering was being able to design and see it come to life and see the full uh, mechanical uh, manufacturing process from like drawing it out on, on either on like SolidWorks or ANSYS and then seeing it go through the full production cycle and then ultimately being manufactured and them using it in the field. Um, so I started out after college, I worked at a smaller engineering firm and there I did um, design on SolidWorks, analysis work, and then ultimately conducting the test. So I had a lot of experience um, to see the full cycle of making products. Um, and then I've been with Honeywell for about, actually I just had my three year anniversary with the company, which is pretty wild. Um, and I worked in the analysis group for a little bit over a year doing compressor design. Um, and then now <laughs> after a year of working there, I was able to go on a rotation group where I ended up in the certification office, which is, we're a pretty new group. We've only been around for four years and, um, it's really interesting to be in a place where was not talked about in school, um, but there are definitely courses that you can take to get more exposure as like a, a higher level technical elective. Um, when you're in your junior and senior year, you can learn more about that, which is pretty wild. Um, and so I've been doing that for um, a little over, I think a little over two years now. And certification is like its own breed. You really work, um, it's, really working with the FAA. Um, compliance is a huge thing. Following the rules, regulations, and making sure that we have a safe product. So it's, um, there's a lot of, uh, in mechanical specifically, it's very versatile. So you can really end up anywhere and use your degree. You don't have to worry about getting stuck. Um, and then the relevant coursework I would say is solid mechanics and structures. Um, just because they're really tough courses, but it teaches you how to problem solve. And then also the design courses as well, since there's many different software your company can end up using. Thank you. Uh, is it Swastik? Did I yeah. say that correctly? Okay, yeah. thank you. Am I audible? Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. First of all, a warm welcome to all of you. Thanks for joining in. Uh, my name is Swastik Banerjee, and much like most of the people, most of the panelists over here, um, I am an ASU graduate. I graduated ASU in 2016 with a bachelor's degree in uh, mechanical engineering, but I do, I did take up a lot of, uh, quite a lot of manufacturing courses as well, and my background in terms of education and experience uh, entails mechanical manufacturing and process improvement, Lean Six Sigma stuff. So before, so currently I work as a design engineer for uh, Caterpillar. Uh, for those of you who are, might not be familiar, it's one of those uh, companies who builds all the major equipments that you see around for constructions and those big trucks, giant trucks that they have, the mine sites and several large equipments. Uh, before this, I used to work uh, for some time at the Arizona Department of Revenue as a process improvement consultant because of my experience and background in Lean Six Sigma. Uh, talking about my current job, um, um, like my skills, more than my skill set as a mechanical engineer, what I learned through college, it was more about um, how I integrated those skills and how I was able to quickly adapt to whatever I was trying to do and learn on a fast paced environment. So definitely my knack and passion in life to tinker with things and build stuff and always had a passion for automotives and machines is what got me into mechanical engineering. And I'm glad that I get to do a lot of design engineering work in like solid modeling, 
And not just that, I also work very closely with manufacturing and supply chain people and also on a supplier collaboration front. And the coolest part of my current job is I, I not only get to work with people here, but because of my company being a multinational company, so I get to work with people in different countries like India, Australia, Canada. So it's a different satisfaction when you see there's something you're contributing to in terms of in what, whatever way possible and that translates into such a big humongous machine that's out there. Um, it's, it's a great satisfaction and a sense of pride. So, yep, that's, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you. Sheila? Good afternoon, this is Sheila Chopin. So I am part of the NXP Global team. So I'm a mechanical engineer by trade and academics and I have an MBA. So I've been with the company. Um, so I started off my career um, in Johnson Space Center working for NASA as a design engineer in the Mission Control Center for two years. So I did that until a Challenger crashed then stayed there for a little while longer and then moved into semiconductor after I got married. So I worked for Texas Instruments. I went to work there for five years working on their development line as a process engineer. So that was really good. So I got a chance to really have a passion for not only mechanical engineer and equipment, but also the materials that actually the equipment was used to manufacture those semiconductor products. Then um, Motorola called me at my desk at Texas Instruments, asked me to come work with them. So I've been at Motorola Freescale, now NXP, our Dutch company for um, over 28 years. So the opportunity to not only continue to work in the field of engineering and semiconductor where automotive is my, my greatest passion and looking at all the things we do in the automotive electronic chip and how to design that out. So I'm a materials technology engineer slash manager what I do on a daily basis. So I found learning to solve problems. It's just been a great thing for me, solve problems. I've co-developed some of the top materials um, for encapsulant thermal set with the suppliers. Um, so I'm just, I love fracture mechanics. Um, I love solving hard problems and also understand its integration into different um, technologies, whether it's automotive or networking or internet of things, etc. So the journey has been the opportunity to take my mechanical engineering degree and my MBA because I actually started the lab and team that I currently have. So the MBA allowed me to actually develop the team I have, start the tools with a different fundamental understanding. So it's been a great journey, continues to be. So it's a global company. So it's about making an impact. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph? Hi, um, I'm Joseph Keffer. Uh, I'm a professional mechanical engineer at Stantec. Um, particularly at Stantec, uh, we've got quite a few different departments, but uh, I currently work in the, uh, in the mining department. Um, I got my start uh, as an engineer um, at uh, New Mexico State uh, University down there in Las Cruces. Uh, and currently I, I live in Tempe and uh, my office is in Chandler. Um, in, the, in the line of work that I do, I, I typically do uh, EPTM type work, which is engineering procurement and construction management. So we'll start with uh, designing, uh, designing mine, mining infrastructure uh, and then take it all the way through to purchasing the infrastructure and then uh, getting it built. Uh, particularly what I like about my job is uh, you get to design stuff and then once you finish designing it, uh, you uh, hopefully get to build it. And being on site and uh, being able to watch things uh, get built is, is pretty cool. Um, in, in regards to mechanical engineering, I guess uh, the, the, the work that I get involved in is, is a lot of uh, based on thermodynamics and uh, fluid dynamics. Uh, a lot of piping and pumping is, is involved in, uh, in building a process plant. And uh, I, I just, I, I really enjoy uh, the mining industry. It's, um, it's a pretty niche industry, but uh, once you get out there and you get to see all the, uh, all the big, big equipment, such as the Caterpillar, the, the big Caterpillar uh, vehicles that they, that they have out there hauling all the rock around, uh, it's quite a, it's quite an experience. Thank you all. All right. The next question uh, will be for all the panelists and uh, we'll go in the same order um, with Pam starting. Uh, the question is, please tell us one piece of career advice 
or a career observation you'd like to ensure our students who just started their ASU education a few weeks ago here. All right, Pam? Yeah, I would say ask questions and keep learning. The only way I was able to get into 3D printing, which didn't exist when I started out, was to kind of reinvent myself, even go back to classes and network and ask people. Uh, I took classes in properties of materials. Um, I took classes in SOLIDWORKS and CAD design. I volunteered at a 3D printing lab so I could begin to get my hands-on experience and just asked questions. People are responsive when you show that you're curious and especially that goes with your professors if you don't understand something in class and you ask a question you got to just get over being embarrassed or concerned that you're the only one you're definitely not the only one who doesn't understand and i've talked to professors who say it's just that the 10 people on either side of you didn't have the courage to ask but how else are you going to learn and tied in with that, when you ask questions, the professor gets to know you. So you're not just a name on an exam. And that ends up being really important later when you need someone to write you a letter of recommendation, whether it's for an internship or a job, because how else are they going to know what's kind of behind what you put down on the paper? And your enthusiasm and willingness to learn is gonna go a huge way. Thank you. Weston? Yeah, so as far as uh, something I wish I would have known earlier on um, is maybe just how important doing an internship might have been. Uh, I was kind of lax about that process. Um, around midway through my sophomore year, I was offered a student worker position and um, that kind of simulated an internship and was actually a little bit better in the fact that I got paid earlier but it didn't look as great on my resume uh, after the fact so it was a little bit more challenging to kind of land a position and I, you know, I got lucky enough to get a position at Boeing but yeah definitely pursuing really kind of any experience uh, in, through internships is just a, a invaluable thing that you could be doing. Perfect, thank you. Jamie? Um, I'm on board with uh, what Pam and Weston have said. Uh, keep, uh, keep asking questions, stay curious and stay excited. There are so many opportunities for you, uh, depending on whatever classes you wanna take, it'll all make you a really well-rounded engineer. And just to follow up with what Weston said, and uh, internships, I wish that I would have known that when I was going to school. I didn't, well, I mean, getting one year junior year um, is more normal, but you can sometimes get them your sophomore year if you're really ambitious. So, you know, just ask around and be, be patient, but it's really good to get one. Thank you. Swastik? So I would contribute by saying that, uh, first of all, be open to networking with as many people as you can. That's very important. And the second most important thing is uh, that I would like to em emphasize is student orgs. Um, I have always believed that student orgs are a great way to simulate uh, like real work working, real world working environments. And not just that, you get a good hand of um, application based learning, because when you're working for student orgs, you're not only using the skills and the concepts that you learn in your classes, but you're actually applying them to build something substantial and taking part in projects and seeing them through completion. So that itself prepares you a lot in terms of um, quite a lot of challenges that you would get out in the real world. So definitely get involved, try to get as much experience you can um, in terms of uh, taking part in student organizations. Thank you. Shiva? You know, one of my favorite things is interns. I've hired so many interns in the corporation and I believe continuously learning is imperative. You must continuously learn. And also intermingling with not only with mechanical engineers, but with chemical engineers, with electrical engineers, with material science engineers. I can guarantee you in many fields, at least my field, 
the tangent understanding of how those other engineering disciplines can intertwine with a mechanical engineer to get a job done is most imperative. I look at just all the patents I have. They are, those patents are, I work on most patents with, mechan with a chemical engineer because I treat my mechanical structure by his chemical knowledge. And a lot of the things that we solve is with some of the tangent of an engineer field. So please continuously learn, connect with others of different fields because the intertwine of those technologies of an engineering field can actually cause you to grow in different disciplines. Thank you, Joseph. Yeah, I, I think the, a very important thing is, uh, is to ensure that your GPA, your freshman year is, is, is good. I think that, um, you know, one of the hardest things to do if, if, you, if you make a, a few mistakes your freshman year is to recover your GPA. And so I would definitely recommend putting more time into your freshman year and then uh, it's, it's a lot harder to tank your GPA if you mess up a class or two in the future than it is to uh, recover your GPA from, uh, from your freshman year going forward. Thank you. I appreciate all of your responses um, to those two questions. We're going to, um, at this time, open it up to our audience questions. And uh, Kathy, our Q&A mod uh, moderator, uh, will take over. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, so yeah, we've got a lot of questions here, some great ones. Um, let's see. So from Cam, uh, we are wondering about, he's wondering about what strategies did you use to be successful in your classes while you were in college? And this is a question uh, any uh, panelist can take. I guess, I guess I can answer it. Uh, I'm, I'm currently taking classes for a master's, um, but I think one of the most important things is, uh, you know, especially in the learning atmosphere that we're in, uh, is to, you know, apply yourself. Um, and I find a significant benefit from working with other students uh, and, and, you know, uh, I guess, uh, connecting with other students uh, and working on them with, to help answer questions, right? And, and if you both have the same question, you can ask the professor, but I think it's important to collaborate and uh, you learn quite a bit, and then you also uh, can kind of keep up those social skills that, uh, you know, COVID's kind of put behind us, right? Great, thank you. All right, and let's see. Uh, we've got another one here from John asking any of the panelists, uh, what do you look for when sorting through resumes? Oh, I can answer that. Um, uh, when we, uh, for Honeywell, when we look at for our interns or for people that we're going to bring on, we look for people who have um, a lot of, I wouldn't say a lot, but like a handful of leadership um, activities that they've either where they've are the leader or they worked in group projects so that they can tell us a little bit more about that role. Also someone who does um, is, and this is kind of untraditional, but someone who has extracurricular activities under their belt, so, or are a part of the organization such as SWE, ASME, or um, SHIP. So, I mean, those are all really uh, great organizations to be a part of, and it kind of shows us that you are great at working with other people. Um, so yeah, that's... That's pretty much it. Great, thank you. Uh, this question comes from Colton. Uh, how do you build your skills and self-confidence in your career? Um, I can go ahead and take that. So basically in terms of your skills and self-confidence that takes time to build for sure. But the key is to be open and to have open communication. So do not be shy to express your interests and uh, get yourself involved in things that you really like to do. 
uh, if you have an issue, if you have problems, or if you are facing, or if you feel that you need additional clarifications, uh, some help with skill building, do reach out to your professors, do reach out to the resources that ASU offers, and there are tons of them. And so they will help you at least get into the door. And once you reach there, then you are obviously getting the opportunity to get involved. And the more you progress, the more you get yourself out there, the more you uh, start getting involved in uh, student organizations or in different projects. If you're doing a project under a professor or under the Fury initiative, or the more you start networking, that gives you a confidence of how or what you have right now, how your profile stand up right now, how they relate to the industry. And definitely networking is a key part of it because a lot of the professionals, when you network with them, they also tell you that what, what all, where do you stand in terms of your current profile and where, what do you need, what skill set are they specifically looking for? And you can definitely work on that. And that's like a good way to validate your current skills and how they relate to the industry. Good, thank you. Yeah, I would like to add to that, you know, and I think that's a very good question because I found that it doesn't matter what your GPA is in rep, you can have a 3.5 or a 4.0. I find many times if you have to be confident in what your ability to deliver. I used to say I could never be a salesperson, but one thing I learned, you have to be able to sell yourself. So you have to be able to understand how the tools, the capabilities you have, that's what you sell into the company. So what can I do with this mechanical engineering degree? How can it impact the business model that you have? And so helping students and be able to, so I found myself continuously learning, continuously see how do I become a best process engineer when I was a process engineer or design engineer in the mission control center. I had to really learn it. And so I spent a lot of times learning in private and additional stuff. I found mentors that found value in me and I would just practice with them or exchange my thinking with them. Building your confidence is most imperative, but it's like being a salesperson, selling what you have to be a benefit, to be a tool, to be an enabler for the company to grow faster and also to grow um, taller or deeper. That's great. Anybody else? All right, um, so there's a fair number of questions around um, how to search uh, and when to search for internships. I'll we'll jump in a little on that. This is Pam. One of the key things that I have found for years is to have a good presence on LinkedIn and uh, following up on what several people have said about networking, LinkedIn seems to be the place where people start posting information about that, particularly with so many things being online now. And at the same time, if you start following other people who are in the industry that interests you, and then eventually making little comments, you're going to get the sort of fast track to when things get posted because in some ways, it's a very tight community in any given field. And once you start following that, you'll see the same names come up in certain companies that are really active in that area. So I think that gives you one path for an inside to find out fairly early on. And then you can reach out directly once you've learned of their existence. I think, I think another important thing is, you know, if, if, you, if you have an idea on, on what you'd like to do, maybe do a search of, of some, local, some local chapters of, of certain groups that are located here in the area. Uh, for example, I'm a part of Society of Mining, uh, Metallurgy and Exploration, and they have chapters here, Tucson, and you know, all around the state of Arizona. And there's students that go to those dinners and they're, and they're typically free, uh, but you can network with all sorts of professionals with all different backgrounds. And uh, once you start networking with them, you know, you can, you can start talking to them about whether they'll have uh, positions open. And I know typically that, you know, most companies, um, they, you know, they, they'll have openings for, for an intern, internship whenever, you know, it's, it's based on your availability. My company, um, we, we carry interns, you know, two or 
two or three of them are, are you know, part-time, you know, year round. Um, and, and so I don't think there's, you know, obviously right before the summer starts, you can start looking for a summer internship, but I don't think, you know, if you start going to these groups and, and, and introducing yourself and talking to people, I, I don't think that most people would have a problem hiring an intern, you know, outside of the uh, summer, summer hours, as long as, uh, as long as, you know, they knew you were, you were outgoing and, and professional. And uh, I don't think, I don't think you'd have an issue finding an internship that way. Thank you. Uh, so this, this next question comes from Spencer. And uh, what is the biggest hurdle to overcome for new engineers entering the industry and the workforce? I'll definitely like to take that up because I've had that oh, fairly for, like, I had that experience fairly sooner. Uh, in my career, because wherever I would go, obviously, I would have a lot of people who are much more experienced, even with the current company I'm with right now. I only joined the company last year. So there was there were these people who have been working in the company for 10, 15, 20 years. And here I am like freshly, like still a beginner and trying to like learn a lot of things. I would say that when you are a new engineer, uh, don't be ashamed to ask questions ask as many questions as you can. There is no wrong question and just be open to learning new things. And more often than not, you will find that it's not about what you know, or, but it's more about how you adapt to the situations and how do you learn along the process? Because there's always gonna be somebody who has more experience, who has more um, like skills than you. So it's always better to learn from them and also contribute the best way you can whenever you are in a particular team or a particular project. And that not only reflects on your attitude, but that also uh, helps build your leadership skills in the process without you actually realizing it actively. So that is something I would definitely say is a challenge to do because you always find yourself in the middle of the ocean amongst all those experienced people, but don't get overwhelmed. It's okay. There is, it's always, there is always a starting point for everybody. So just make the most out of it, ask questions, and just try to put yourself out there in terms of adapting to different projects and situations. That's a great answer. I like that about adapt adaptation. Um, all right, so let's see. We have one from Mark asking, what are some challenges, mistakes, or maybe even regrets you have made in your career that uh, that we as freshmen might make and could avoid? I'll jump in on that for one thing. <laughs> Document what you're doing. I have learned the hard way a couple of times that when I was asked to structure an experiment and then you know work it through and then report on it, I I didn't write down every detail of what I had done. And when you're at the front of the room and you have to defend what you did and explain it, it's way better if you've overdone recording data and processes and steps so that you could either explain it or repeat it. And to this day in, in my job, I, I think about that it helps me structure even documents that I write, like worksheets. In 3D printing, I'm always working with a different customer every day, trying to help them create a part that fulfills needs that they have for a certain application, whether it's like uh, strength or temperature resistance. And I need to tell them the decisions that I made in designing and setting up a part on a particular printer and with a certain material. So, documenting, even if it seems kind of tedious, whether it's handwritten or better yet, you come up with something where you, you know, can record everything digitally and even taking pictures along the way of mechanical parts, anything to help communicate to the customer. So I would say that was a mistake I had to learn a bit on the way. Mm -hmm. I'll have to input on that. So, you know, what I've found is that making sure you understand your audience, so whether you're communicating to a technician, another engineer, a director, a vice president, a supplier, understand your audience. 
I tell myself and my staff that we're the transmitter, they're the receiver, and their noise is in the line. Maybe there's a short in the line. The noise could be a void, it could be something that you just didn't understand and what you transmitted did not provide the understanding that was needed for the recipient to get the thing done or whatever they needed to get done. So really understand your audience and making sure that your audience, what you transmit meets the expectation of the audience. For instance, even when you're preparing your resume, if you prepare for an aerospace company or if you prepare for an industrial company or semiconductor company, make sure your audience, what you transmit is clearly understood to the recipient, thereby there's no noise in the line and you transfer it cognitively and it's successful. Thank you. Um, let's see, we have, um, what modern, this is from Cam, what modern engineering tools, uh, for example, software packages for modeling and simulation, would you recommend learning while we're in college? I would like to jump in on that. So um, definitely in terms of modeling, I would definitely recommend having experience with SolidWorks. Uh, that's a very, very industry and user-friendly software. Uh, but I would also say that if you can get some experience with Creo, that's also, that also comes in very handy. Uh, my current job, uh, the software that we use is primarily Creo, but then I would definitely say that I had majority of my experience was in SolidWorks. So I had an understanding of the CAD platform and um, like uh, CAD drawings and, and how to read blueprints and all of that. So that came in very handy. But in so Creo and SolidWorks would be in terms of modeling. And if you're going into FEA, um, if you can uh, try to get your hands on ANSYS, I'm pretty sure you have ANSYS as part of your coursework, but if not, definitely try to get that, uh, get some experience with ANSYS and maybe Nastran or Abacus. But it, it again depends on what resources you have, but ANSYS, SolidWorks and Creo are some of the softwares that I would definitely recommend um, trying your hands on. I think if, if you're working in an industry that, that's, doing, that's doing construction or constructing anything, uh, typically a lot of software packages you would use are, are Revit or any AutoCAD uh, package. Um, I, I also typically use ANSYS quite a bit, which conveniently uh, get it through PADT. Um, and, and you, you use ANSYS quite a bit for uh, flow modeling and stuff like that um, during different design phases. Uh, but I think, I think uh, SolidWorks is also a good one, but definitely uh, also AutoCAD, AutoCAD products. And one of the biggest things that I struggle with these days is, uh, is the cloud software, right? So on AutoCAD, you've got uh, You've got what is it, BIM 360, and and so all these all these platforms are moving to more of a cloud service, and so understanding that is going to be a huge deal uh, coming up in 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 all in all industries. Um, I would jump in to say for Honeywell we use NX, so if you're going the design route, um, we use NX, um, and then for well to chime in with uh, Swastik said is um, Ansys. Ansys is huge for analysis work and then if you're going the programming route i would recommend matlab and then also if you're i know in our in our group we have a couple people who do python as well so that doesn't hurt very good uh we have a question here uh for jamie from kashavi uh Jamie, what does your job as a certification engineer entail as a human component? Meaning, do you feel pressure or guilt if the product is turns out unsafe? Uh, that's a really great question. Um, so at Honeywell, we have, uh, there's a lot of iterations that go into um, making sure that that doesn't happen. So, um, for example, we um, the process typically looks like the internal team of who's immediately working on the program works on it. And then we review it with um, subject matter experts, which is like 
uh, chief um, a compliance specialist who knows the regulations really well. And then um, if there's further questions, then we have like a review with the FAA. Um, so it's, it's tough because you want to take precautions and those regulations are in place for a reason and you have to um, meet those regulations to show that your product's going to be safe. But in actuality, when you're, um, uh, this is hard, um, when, the pro, uh, when the product goes out into the field, you want to take precautions as much as you can to make sure nothing happens, but that it doesn't, there's still a very, very, very small chance that something could happen. So, because um, nothing, I mean, when we design, we design with our best practices, but there's always a chance that something could go wrong. Um, hopefully that answered your question, but yeah, Honeywell always prides themselves on safety. So there are a lot of iterations a product goes through before it goes into production to make sure that doesn't happen. Very good, <clears throat> thank you. Um, this question is for anyone on the panel or as many on the panel from Isaac. Um, many people, myself included, go into engineering because they loved creating and making things as a kid. How well does engineering as a career make this dream come true? So uh, if I could jump in on that, um, that's actually a very near and dear question to myself. Uh, when I had started out, you know, all I wanted to do was basically build big kid Legos and go and put something together uh, that's not really the true reality of engineering. There is plenty of that to be done, but there is also a lot of uh, kind of calculations, paperwork, uh, tertiary things that kind of pull away from that kind of creativity. Uh, I, I would say it depends on which company you end up working for. Obviously, a big company like Boeing, we have a lot of procedures, a lot of uh, specifications that really kind of narrow down what it is you should be doing when you're engineering something. Whereas maybe a smaller company, they don't have maybe as many of those limitations. Uh, so you might have a little bit more creative freedom. But there is always... Uh, different uh, divisions within a company that you could kind of flex those creativity skills if you were more inclined. Uh, for specifically at Boeing, we have a uh, rapid prototyping group that actually deals a lot with 3D printing um, and kind of doing quick solutions or quick uh, temporary uh, fixes for design issues on the shop floor. So if that is the kind of area you want to focus, being able to just be creative and just come up with a design solution, there's definitely avenues for that. Uh, you just have to kind of find them. I can add a little something to that. Um, I agree with all of that. Also, another thing to remember is that your, your job is going to constantly involve, whether it's at one company or as you change companies. I think people say that you end up having seven different careers in your life. And it's okay to decide that you're not really happy with what you're doing after you've been doing it a while. Maybe you've outgrown it. My first job had me designing a very small but important component of a radar system. And I got bored with it after a while. It, it just seems so repetitive. So I switched into systems level design and I thought that was so cool because it actually suddenly made sense why the component I was working on had certain parameters that I had to stick with and it was how it fit in with all the other parts along the sort of chain of that system and I had got a lot more uh, pleasure out of what I was doing because I had the bigger picture but again after some years of that, then I wanted to do something else. And the 3D printing brought me into a whole different area where I could be creative 
and help people again. So just want to make the point that your, your job and your interests evolve and that's perfectly fine. Great, thank you. Um, I do want to mention we've got a, a ton of, of questions, a lot of great questions here, and um, I, I don't think we'll be able to get through all of them, but uh, we sure are trying. So um, thank you, panelists. Um, a couple are related to graduate school and um, whether the panelists feel that going to graduate school right after your bachelor's degree is, is recommended, um, is do you recommend graduate school at all? And if so, when, I guess. I, I can answer that. Um, I, so I, I started graduate school. I've been, I've been out of school for about six years now and I just started going to graduate school. Um, I found that, you know, getting out, working in the industry uh, has two benefits, right? One, you, you, you can possibly find a company like mine that's willing to pay for you to go to graduate school, which is, which is extremely nice. Um, and, and two, you know, you actually can get into a, a job and understand what it is that you actually want to do, right? You may, you may get a mechanical engineering job and you might be like, I don't want to be a mechanical engineer anymore. And you might want to go into, into business or something like that, right? But I think, I think uh, as an engineer, you need to get a little bit of experience before you, uh, before you can make the determination on whether or not grad school is right for you. Uh, there's a lot of people that I work with in my industry that have bachelor's degrees, and there's a lot of people in my industry that, uh, that have master's and PhDs. Um, I think if you find something that you're really, really interested in and you want to research it, and uh, then, then, yeah, by all means, maybe go into get a, get a, get a PhD in that, right? Um, but I think, I think for, for most people, you know, getting some experience, figuring it out, figuring out what exactly you want to do, and then making a decision on, on graduate school is probably the best thing, right? You can, you can go as an engineer, you know, you can go and get an MBA and, and, and take more of a business route inside of a company, right? Or you can go and get a master's degree in something. I'm getting a master's degree in mineral processing to, uh, to, to help assist me with, uh, with, some, with some processing of minerals, right? Um, so I think, but it's important to go and get some experience and understand what it is exactly that you want to do, because otherwise you're just spending a lot of money and you may not even know if you like it or not. Great, thank you. Uh, this question is for Sheila uh, and anyone else who has hired interns. Uh, what kind of characteristics do you look for when you are hiring interns? And in general, what kinds of things could a freshman do to build these characteristics? Yes, so uh, what I look for is normally when we have a problem, uh, like this past summer, I had an intern from Auburn University and we was working on, he was doing thermomechanical modeling um, for a simulation for a product. So I just want to understand the specific passion for, and he was working on his PhD in um, material science. And so in mechanical engineering, he had some depth in. Just to understand their passion for one, um, the science itself, because it was understanding some things that with the project itself. And also um, making sure that the person has a desire to, to quickly learn. So uh, I look for students who have a passion to learn and a passion to understand how what they have will contribute to what we need. And that's why I love hiring interns, because I find that the number one response back to after hiring an intern, and I've hired over 20, and my last 20 years, at, at the intern that I'm still connected with, she's a, she's a medical, she's a, um, a medical assistant. So she said she didn't want to do engineering after working with us in semiconductor um, 28 years ago. So she's a physician assistant. And so that's good. She learned that that's not what she wanted. So um, making sure that they have a passion for what they do and they can understand that passion. But the number one thing was how fast we must deliver on a solution. That's what they need, how fast we must deliver on the solution. So I think an intern must understand what they have and what they can deliver in a short period of time. Fantastic. 
Uh, let's see, we've got a question here from David uh, asking, what are your thoughts or mindset on failure? Uh, like, do you ex encourage trying new things even if you might fail at them? Oh, I can, I can answer that. Um, I would, um, I would encourage you to explore what um, what approach works best for you. Um, in the workplace, there is there are always people who will come to you and tell you how to do something, um, but that approach may not work for you. Um, so it's really important for you to experiment to see what approach works best for you. Um, it's hard when you're taking courses because there is a time limit. Um, so if you can like give your give yourself like maybe a couple weeks or like, I don't know, a couple days in the sense of if there's something that's due um, to see how you want to approach it. And then if it doesn't work, ask for help. Um, but yeah, I think it's really important to experiment because you learn a lot about yourself as a person and as a worker on what works for you and what doesn't. And not every tool that will work for you, will that works for someone else will work for you. Good. All right. Thank you, panelists, so much for um, all of your responses. Um, we have a few minutes left. So in the last few minutes, um, we're uh, going to have one more general question to all of our panelists. And it really is, um, what parting uh, words of wisdom do you have that you'd like to share with our uh, first year students? So again, this is for all of our panelists. And we'll start with Pam. Okay. Uh, I think you should volunteer with an organization, whether it's something at ASU or outside, and whether it's in your professional field that you're thinking of or outside of that, or both. You know, more is better in a way, because you're going to learn about yourself. You're going to learn how to work on a team. You're going to get experiences that you can share. And that's all going to look great when you go for any kind of job down the road. Thank you. Weston? There's a lot of things I would like to say here, but I guess I will stick to one and say that, uh, you know, you, you should try to challenge yourself outside of class. Um, I know that may sound a little bit daunting, but for instance, being that I, I enjoyed doing things in CAD, I would model things on my own and having a 3D printer, I could, you know, go print these things. So I would uh, kind of give myself a design challenge and try and model up some assembly and create it and then learn from all of the mistakes I made and create it again. And, you know, you might not have access to a 3D printer, but I believe you can get into a 3D print lab at ASU to print things. Um, but yeah, just giving yourself kind of design tasks or tasks of things that you think you might be interested in outside of school or outside of the job. And that will kind of, one, prove to you whether or not that's the thing you want to be doing or if maybe you want to look at a different aspect of engineering or two, uh, you know, that you maybe need to sharpen your skills in certain programs or certain uh, activities. Thank you. Jamie? Um, I agree with Weston and uh, Pam. I would even go so far to say for design, if you know that that's what you're interested in, I would put together a portfolio because when you are, let's say, the internship or if you look into that and they really specialize in design and they're asking you about SOLIDWORKS and you can say, hey, I just, I did these on my own spare time, but this is what I'm capable of. And, you know, this kind of showcases my skills. Thank you. Swastik? I would say uh, be very proactive in terms of uh, going to career events and different career fairs doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna get an internship or something, but just putting yourself out there, talking to professionals, it not only uh, increases our 
enhances your communication skills, but it also lets you know what's going on in the industry. And in the process of communicating with them, you learn what they are doing and see how it uh, relates to what you are trying to do and just get advice from them. Networking is not only just in, uh, to reach out for jobs, but it also is about being um, active and aware about what's going on in the industry and making connections for the longer run. Thank you. Sheila? Yes, so, you know, um, be confident about who you are and that takes time, but it can take, you can accelerate that yourself. I'll give a quick good example is that one of our, our sons, we have two sons, one of them is at UT Austin in architect. He's in his fifth year as architect, he's an honor student. I want him to do industrial engineer and he wanted to do architect. So I told him to write me an essay, write me an essay, tell me the difference between architect and civil engineer and what's on the inside of you that would deliver on an architect professional compared to civil engineer. He wrote that essay so well, describing his content of who he was and how he can deliver on it. And I said, go do architect. And so even in his study abroad in Europe, he was one of the top students who did well. He used that same article, out three, one out of three articles to get into UT Austin. So spend some time thinking about who you are and how you can deliver on who you are for whatever the skill is that you want to deliver on in whatever field. So take time to really know who you are and that will breed the confidence to come forth and make the impact that you definitely want to make. Thank you. Joseph. Yeah, I guess uh, my best advice would be uh, don't get discouraged. Um, there's there's going to be a lot of, a lot of failure. Um, you're going to fail a test. You're going to fail a class, you know, don't let that discourage you from the great future that you may have, right? I, to this day, you know, I, I you know, I, I do something wrong at work or something like that. I don't let it drag me down because ultimately I've, I've, I'm, I'm doing a really good job and, and I think every single one of you will do a really good job, but no matter what, just don't get discouraged. You know, there's always, there's always a new door new opportunity out there waiting for you if, if something happens, but uh, just keep your head up and, and keep going. Again, thank you all. Those were, we really appreciate all of the responses. Um, I just want to say on behalf of the Fulton Schools of Engineering, I would like to thank all of our panelists uh, for their time and their insight. Um, panelists, you are welcome to mute yourself and listen to the next panel, or you can leave and have a wonderful evening. Um, if you do end up leaving, um, please make sure, uh, if you end up leaving the meeting um, and make me a host, if it prompts you to do so. Um, students, after a three minute break, we will start the next panel. Um, and we will see you uh, in a few minutes.
Hi, do we have our panelist screen? Hi, this is Craig. Hi, hi Craig, good, you're here. Yes. Um, I, I would like to thank all of you. Do we have Craig, James, Diola, Yanish? Yeah, Diola, are you here? I'm here. Perfect, Yanish? Present, ma'am. Perfect, thank you, Claire. I'm here. Great, thank you. We, I don't see the screen yet for, of your pictures. Hopefully that will come up soon. Um, but I would like to thank our panelists for taking time out of their day to be on mechanical engineering, to, to be here for our, the mechanical engineering career exploration night. There you are, great. Now we can see what you look like, perfect. As uh, the moderator, I will start with prepared questions directed to some or all of the panelists. Panelists, I will use your name so you will know the question is directed toward you. And if you would like to pass on answering a question, please just feel free to say pass, add, or agree with someone else's statement. Students, your attendance is being recorded based on your registration information and length in the meeting. The attendance list will be given to your ASU 101 instructor. Please use the QA box on the black Zoom bar to type career-related questions for our panelists and you can make up questions or use the questions from your workbook. If the question is directed to specific panelists, please include their names in your question, and please feel free to type in your questions now. Our QA moderator will read your questions shortly. Uh, if all the panelists will please take yourself off mute, but remain off of video, please, and we'll begin. This question, this first question is for all the panelists to help our undergraduate first year students know a bit about you as they formulate their questions, please give your minute or two minute professional, tell me about yourself pitch, including how your formal education is used in your current or previous roles. And let's start with Craig. Hey everyone, I'm Craig. I work for Nissan at the test track outside of Phoenix. Um, I've been there for 17 years now, and uh, this was actually my seventh job, so I've, I've done a few different things. Um, I don't think that I use much of my schoolwork in the career that I'm in now. It's, it's mostly project management, but I don't think that the coursework I took is, was bad for me at all. It's just, it gives you a certain toughness and tenacity and ability to handle uncertainty better than, than most people can that aren't engineering students or majors. So um, I think uh, being a hands-on type person has helped me a lot. My, my dad was a, a mechanic, and so I learned how to work on cars and do those things, and, and uh, that's definitely helping me in my career now. Thank you, Craig. Okay. Diola? Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Diola. So I graduated with a manufacturing engineering degree. Um, but I also did mechanical engineering before I switched it over. So I did that for a few years. Um, I have not used my the, the mechanical side of my degree working at NXP. I've been there for going on a couple years now. Um, started last January. So I do a lot of in a lot of um, on the industrial engineering side of things. Um, working with the operations team, some project management in there, um, but I'm, I'm, it varies, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's mostly industrial engineering for me. Thank you. Uh, Gyanish. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Gyanish. I work as a senior mechanical engineer at ASM America. I graduated with as you can see, a mechanical engineering degree. I graduated with a master's degree about two and a half years ago from ASU. And I've been working as a mechanical engineer. So if you have any doubts in your classes as to, hey, when am I ever gonna use this particular formula or when am I gonna use this equation? I'm doing it. And contrary to what I've heard before, I'm actually applying a lot of the principles that I learned in my courses, especially during my undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering, in my day-to-day -day life, in my day-to-day -day projects. 
and it's it's been quite eye-opening how much you can take away from the class and how much you wish you'd taken away more from the class when you deal with all the problems that I face daily. So I think it's definitely played a big role. Thank you so much. Claire? Hey everybody, my name is Claire and I actually just graduated in this past May. So I uh, started my job at Texas Instruments as an equipment engineer a little bit over a month ago. Um, and it's out in Dallas, Texas. Um, basically what my job is, is I do problem solving on the manufacturing floor um, to avoid issues that we see on the manufacturing floor in the future. Um, so we don't make calculators, we do make semiconductors. Um, but the interesting thing about my job is that it's, it's kind of what you would stereotypically describe as like a, a fix-it engineer. Um, so I basically, sometimes I have to do coding and sometimes I have to do electrical engineering work and sometimes I do mechanical engineering. And so to some extent, I use the things that I've done in classes. Um, I have both an undergrad and a master's from ASU. I did the four plus one program. Um, but the majority of the things that I do, the skills that I learned from classes are really problem solving skills. And that's really what I use the most on my day to day job. Sure, I use AutoCAD or SolidWorks or whatever programs I use, but for the most part, um, the things that I'm using are problem solving. Awesome, thank you so much. James? Hi, uh, James, I'm a Chief Vehicle Systems Engineer over at Local Motors here in the, in the Valley. Um, I've been at Local Motors a little over 10 years ago, started there as an intern. Uh, now I'm the Chief Vehicle Systems Engineer for our primary product, which is an autonomous all-electric shuttle. Um, I end up using most of my schooling stuff. Uh, it varies is probably the best answer. Um, today, I used it a lot. This month, I used it a lot. Last month, not as much. Um, so it, it really varies, but you know, there's there's certainly days where, you know, I still have all of my textbooks on my in my library here uh, that I either have at home or at work, and I am, you know, going and uh, referencing those as well as my notes from classes, pretty often. So uh, it definitely has has played a big part in my life is is having all of that education that experience. Uh, but to echo everyone else mostly what I'm doing is problem solving and having that, the ability to go and do that problem solving. Thank you so much. Uh, this next question is for all of the panelists again. Can you please tell us one piece of career advice or a career observation that you'd like to ensure that our students hear? And we'll start with Craig again. Can you say that again? Like Sure. Uh, tell us one piece of career advice or a career observation that you'd like to share? Hmm. I think just in general, uh, especially when I was starting out, I, I was surprised at the pace of engineering. Like I thought that uh, people would be kind of on fire to change everything that wasn't, wasn't perfect immediately. And uh, I think in general, it moves a lot slower than that. So be prepared for that. Thank you. And Diola, am I saying your name correctly? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, we'd love to hear from you and what your thoughts are. Um, my, mine would be similar to Craig's. Um, the work environment that you'll find yourself in when you graduate might be very different from what you're used to. The pace is different. The people you're with, the day-to-day -day challenges will be different. Um, so don't be afraid. Um, don't be afraid to talk with people in and out of your group, the people you see daily or people you've met for the first time. Don't be afraid to just, even if it's just a general conversation, just learning what they do. Um, and I say this because we had an intern um, last year who left after a couple of weeks because the group that she was in, there was nobody within her age group, nobody, you know, who was a, a person of color, and she felt very daunted by that. So don't, don't be afraid to be in a new space, new people, um, no one's going to bite you. <laughs> so that, that would be my advice. 
Oh, thank you so much. Uh, Gyanish. I think one key piece of information that I would like to give in my short career so far, or something that I've learned is just because you leave the classroom doesn't mean you stop learning. This line might sound a little bit cliche, but it's the truth that I've learned because even after transitioning over to my job, I've had to learn so many different things and so many new aspects, echoing what Diola said, never be afraid. Most importantly, never be afraid to learn a new thing. Awesome, I really like that, thank you. Claire? I would say that my biggest piece of career advice has been use your resources to the best of their abilities, um, especially as a young person in a workforce. Your biggest strength off the bat is not going to be how well you know your job. It's actually going to be how well you know how to use your resources. So like I said, I just started a month ago and being able to know how to Google things quickly and efficiently has been so useful. Um, knowing who to ask for the right thing has been a very big help. And so I think the biggest thing is like people say you want to network. Um, but when they say network, they really mean use your resources, know how to effect effectively find the answer to your problem, know how to find the right person who can answer your questions, and you will go so much farther than just waiting for things to fall in your lap. Really good advice. Thank you. James? Uh, so I want to echo most of what everyone else says, uh, although actually sort of I'll, I'll contradict Craig's statement on uh, the, the speed of things. I think that depends on where you go. Uh, I can't keep up at the speed of, where, of change where we're at, um, which is, is very rapid, but I think we have a, you know, we're sort of unique in that. Um, but the other thing is, you know, I, I think if there's something that you're passionate about and you see a company that does that and you see an open position, even if it doesn't match exactly what you're going for, I'd say go for it. Get your foot in the door and once you're inside the company, it's a lot easier to move around and show off your skill set and possibly move into different positions. Um, like I said, I started as an intern and I've, I, I have trouble putting down on paper on a resume what I've done because it's been so all over the place, especially to, to echo uh, Ganesha's point. Um, I've learned so many different skill sets after leaving the classroom. You know, I, I would consider myself a subject matter expert on like a dozen different things that I never thought I would be a subject matter expert in. Um, so, you know, there's always that opportunity to learn more and, you know, to tap those resources, like Claire said, of, of the people around you and different resources you have to, to always be learning. Yeah, I'm gonna jump in on that one, James. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I think it points out the key differences between working at a, a huge corporation like Nissan and working at somebody who's doing a, solving a lot of the same problems, but with a much, much, much smaller team like, like James at Local Motors. So keep that in mind when you're looking for a job. If you want to have your hair on fire daily, then you can expect that at a smaller company where you can have, a, have to wear a lot of different hats, like I'm sure James does. Whereas yes. I, worked at, I worked at GM uh, briefly, and GM felt like every change you make was like trying to move the earth. And Nissan's much, much better than that, but it's still a, a, a very large corporation. Interesting. James, did you want to say something? Oh, uh, that's all That's all very valid points. I, I had myself muted while I was laughing, uh, talking about <laughs> that. But yes, my I'm surprised I still have a whole full head of hair because it is always on fire. That's a great way to put it. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to open up the questions now to the audience. Um, QA moderator, do you have some questions for our panelists? I certainly do. Thank you. Um, let's see. This first question is for all panelists, and it comes from Scott. How did you find your niche in engineering or in your career in general? And what experiences would you recommend seeking uh, to help a student like me discover that niche passion? I can take this question if no one else wants to chime in first. Okay, I'll take that as a green signal. I think the best way, or if you ask most of us, I think we're still trying to find our own niches. We haven't 
fixated on that one particular thing that we you know, wholeheartedly keep doing all the time. And like someone said before, if there is that one thing, eventually you probably might get bored of it. So the best thing to do in your position, if you're a student right now, is to join an organization or a club or some sort of a student organization that will give you an exposure to as many different roles as possible. And just get your hands dirty and try to see what works. Try to see what you like. And that will give you a feel for your niche. Yeah, I just want to second that. Um, one of the really big benefits of being in college, and I will stand by this piece of advice until I die, is that your life kind of ends every semester and that all of the obligations that you have, whatever's going on in your life, regardless of how horrible or how awesome it's going, is probably going to restart next semester when you have a whole set, different set of classes. And so you can really use that to your advantage to figure out what you like. You can sign up for hundreds of different things. Maybe you want to sign up for 10 clubs your first year go for it because it's going to reset the next semester or the next year. And if you find that you've overworked yourself, sometimes it happens, um, but you'll know yourself a lot better because you know what your limits are and you can much better figure out what it is you're interested in. If you get to a club and you, you try to go to the meetings and you're like, wow, I just can't do this, then that means it's not right for you. And so it's a really great way to practice. Um, same with internships as well. Um, apply to all of the internships that you think are remotely interesting. You might find that you like them a lot better um, that's how I actually ended up in semiconductors. I originally wanted to do aerospace uh, related work. And then I interned at Texas Instruments and I was like, wow, this is so much cooler than I ever thought it could be. Um, so try different things. Go crazy while you're still in college. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and third that one, especially on the clubs. Um, I was heavily, heavily involved with the Baja SAE program with the Society of Automotive Engineers. And that sort of forever changed my life. Um, you know, like to this day, I am still involved in that program outside of, outside of the school, outside of my professional career on a volunteer basis. Um, I, I felt like that really solidified my niche and uh, helped me find the engineer that I really could be. That's great. All right, we have a uh, question for Diola. Uh, this comes from Sanjay and he says, though I'm doing mechanical engineering, I'm really interested in industrial engineering as well. Can mechanical engineers do well in the field of industrial engineering? I believe so. Um, at the site that I work at, um, two of our previous industrial engineers where they graduated from ASU with mechanical engineering degrees. Um, one of them is still an industrial engineer, but at a different site. And the other is in a rotational program where he's now an equipment engineer. But I think so, because when you graduate and you enter the workforce, a lot of the times you don't really know, you won't know much about the industry that you're in. And most of the people there will just expect that you're just you're going to be learning a lot of your first year will be learning the people around you the resources you have just understanding the industry and the products and so what you're really going to dig into is your problem solving skills as an engineer and you're going to dig into that and leverage that and that will help you become a good engineer, a really great engineer, whether that's industrial or any kind. So yes, short answer. <laughs> <laughs> good deal. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. How about Craig? Uh, would you consider your current job to be an engineering job? And if not, how did you prepare yourself to successfully switch to a different career path? That comes from Hans. Craig, I don't know if you're still muted, perhaps. Sorry, I was muted. I, I, you guys missed a great 30 <laughs> seconds too. The, uh, I'm definitely titled as an engineer, but uh, my work is almost 100% project management. So uh, it was kind of a gradual switch. I mean, I, I then 
essentially what I do is I, we test the, the cars and trucks and we find problems and then we communicate how, what's happening and then help them try to fix, help the design engineers try to fix them. So um, we don't, we aren't responsible most of the time for any calculations or any, you know, uh, engineering type work like that, but it's important for us to understand all of the inputs and outputs that are happening and communicate those as variables that might be influencing why the thing is failing or working. Um, it's, it's also good to understand and have, you know, the capability to juggle all of the different variable, variables that might be coming up in terms of uh, manufacturing tolerances and supplier quality and, and material quality. It's, it's, it's really, it can be just about anything. And the longer you do this, the more you're, you're able to juggle those different things. I don't think that uh, I, I really did anything to uh, to prepare myself for that. Um, I'm actually wouldn't mind switching now to do something that's a little bit more creative and a little even more, uh, even less engineering, I guess. Uh, but uh, I've been doing this for a long time, so it's it's tough to switch. We'll see. Maybe I'll end up at Nissan's headquarters in Nashville next year. All right. Thank you. Um, for Ganesh, um, two questions. What is your company and how useful has uh, your graduate degree been to your career? Do you think you've gained benefits from that graduate degree uh, that you wouldn't have had if you only had a bachelor's degree? Okay, two questions for me. I see how it is. <laughs> 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 Just kidding. The company I work for is ASM America, which is Advanced Semiconductor Materials. So I'm also in the semiconductor industry, much like Claire. And what I do is I design equipment or I design tools, which are then supplied to uh, chip makers or wafer manufacturers like Intel. And they create all the wonderful devices that power your phones or laptops or fridges or any electronic device, basically. So I design the tools that make that happen. I, from small component level designs to large system level designs, which could be you know, the biggest of my projects. That's kind of what I work in. That's what ASM America is about. We do, when I say we, I mean, my company does chemical processes on wafers. And as far as my degree is concerned and how, how much it helped me, I think I would say my undergraduate degree helped me far more than my graduate degree in preparing me for the current job that I'm doing. Simply because I didn't fully understand the depth of knowledge that I was gaining in my undergraduate degree. I did, an, I did a graduate course right after I graduated from my undergraduate degree. And I straight away, I went into the graduate program. I picked up a lot of topics that were to my liking, which involved a lot of material science um, for a change. But what I did learn according to um, all my degrees, uh, according to all my classes was problem solving number one. Number two, the diverse nature of the problems that I could encounter is something that I found out in my graduate degree that my undergrad didn't prepare me for. But as far as my day-to-day -day problem solving is concerned, I use all the concepts that were taught to me in my undergrad degree. I'd also like to jump in here because I recently got a master's as well. Um, I had the luck of being able to intern once while I was a full-time undergrad, uh, once right before I, like after I had done semesters of like master's classes and then now I'm full-time having a full master's degree. It's very interesting what you will find relevant and what you won't find relevant. Um, grad school is super useful if you know how to tailor it to your job. So I was able to take classes that I was specifically interested in that were related to the job that I knew I wanted because I had already interned there. Um, that's the biggest benefit that I find for grad school, but it's also a really great way to not be an adult just yet. Um, I found it really useful to be able to put off 
making a full decision about what career I wanted to do because I just wasn't sure yet. Um, and so it was really nice to be able to take classes that I knew were I was interested in, um, try to figure out if I was interested in like maybe going towards a PhD or something like that, and then not having to be a full adult and move somewhere else just yet because I didn't think I was ready for that. I'd actually like to add a little bit more on that. Master's degree is indeed a great way to find out if you're on the edge of whether to do a PhD or not. I think a master's degree is a great way to find out. And that's all I had to say. <laughs> Good deal, thank you. Um, this next one is uh, for Claire and Diola uh, coming from heaven. And are there any challenges uh, being a woman in engineering? Um, so for me, when I joined NXP, I quickly learned that we have a women's leadership team. It's um, one of the employee resource groups that we have, and they have been a really supportive group for me in that, you know, I, I noticed that a lot of the women there were very strong women, very strong in terms of leadership, in terms of the things that they know, how they lead meetings and workshops and things like that. So very early on, they immediately became my role models. Um, so personally, I haven't had any struggles as a woman in the engineering field, but I know that there are people who have had trouble being heard in meetings, um, trouble asserting themselves in meetings and that's something that you know once they share that with any of us um, we you know work with them in terms of like coaching this is how you might address this situation that you had with this person this meeting or this manager or whatever um, it takes time change getting used to a new environment takes time and so long as you have people there that you can look up to help you out, you'll be okay. You'll learn how to handle things. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Uh, for me, I was really involved in the Society of Women Engineers in both undergrad and grad school. And it kind of gave me a little bit of like, it was a great resource, an amazing thing to be involved in. But it gave me a very warped perspective of how many women I would see in my job. Um, <laughs> which is good and bad. Um, the biggest thing that I have felt personally is that a lot of times, so I work in particular a area of semiconductor that has very, very few women. So last summer in the factory I was in, um, there was only one female equipment engineer in the whole factory. Right now, I think the large factory that I'm working in, there's probably like four or five of us. And it's because we do a lot of really hands-on work. Uh, we've cl we climb inside tools and whatnot. And the biggest thing for me has not been the lack of women. It's literally just been the weird nuances of semiconductors. So I can't wear makeup in the fab. Um, I have to wear a hairnet when I go into the factory and you would be amazed at how much hair falls out of that hairnet when you have long hair. Um, and so it's just been like little tiny nuances that have really been like, they've caught me off guard because when you ask your supervisor, hey, what do I wear to work? They're not gonna think, oh, I need to tell this person that they need to not wear makeup because um, they won't be allowed to wear that in the factory. So it's just been an interesting adjustment. But one of the reasons I did pick TI is because they did an amazing job at A, having a women's initiative, uh, but they actually had higher level uh, manufacturing managers come and talk to all of us as interns um, that were females to say, hey, look, this is what I've done with my career. Uh, these are like, this is what my family is like, and this is what my life is like, and you can absolutely be a woman at this company. So it's it's been fun. Um, I love it because nobody forgets my name. They're just like, oh yes, the redheaded woman, like, because there's really not that many of them. Um, and so it's been, it's, it's kind of cool to stand out. Like everybody knows who you are, um, except I don't know them. So it's a good time. Yeah, that's funny that you mentioned the no makeup one. Cause when I did my internship, I remember my manager feeling a little bit awkward about telling me um, the no makeup rule. <laughs> But you get, I got used to it. So long as yeah. everybody else is not wearing makeup, I'm fine with that. <laughs> yeah, shout out to Barbara Haney for giving me a heads up before I actually showed up there. <laughs> <laughs> All 
deal. Uh, and now we've got a question for James and Craig. This comes from Zachary uh, saying, it seems like a lot of people have family that are in the automotive world before they start a career in the automotive world. How would someone who has no prior connections try to find a way in to a career in the automotive world? James, go first. I've been first all night. All right. Uh, well, I'm going <laughs> to kind of go back to my default then of, uh, you know, the, the SAE experience I had uh, doing the Baja program or, you know, any of the other uh, programs that SAE offers. They, they really do provide you real world experience. Um, and, you know, when I know as, as a hiring manager myself, when I've looked at it, that's, it's almost an instant, I will interview you if you have one of those programs on there, because I know that it shows passion towards that. And, you know, I think that's the, probably the biggest thing more than knowing people is being able to show that you have passion about that. Um, I, I've hired, well, I shouldn't say I, it was more the company hired a few people that were you know, it was pretty clear they weren't passionate about automotive. And for me in my company, that's super important. And they just didn't, they, they fizzled after a while because if you weren't passionate about it, you just, you couldn't keep up with the pace we were going and you didn't have that drive to solve those exact types of problems. Um, but at the same time, you know, like I, I recently hired someone that did rocketry as his project while he was in school. And he was one of the brightest engineers I've ever hired, but he was just passionate about problem solving and passionate about engineering. And it showed through his resume and showed as soon as I talked to him. And, you know, for me, it was a, an easy decision to bring him on. Um, but also to sort of answer your question, I didn't know anyone in the automotive industry. Um, and I didn't have any family in the automotive industry. My dad does HVAC installation. So, um, yeah. Deal. <clears throat> I'm on muting. You're muting. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I agree with what James said. I don't think it's critical that you that you know that. I'm, I'm typing an answer right now to Salvador about uh, his questions about uh, making your own project or building or repairing your own car. A absolutely, 100%. And and uh, since you probably won't have a lot of relevant work experience when you graduate, put that stuff on your resume. I mean, on my resume right now, I still have the fact that, you know, I have a 2008 Corvette that I work on. I, I built a 63 Falcon wagon pretty much from the ground up, you know, engine stuff, suspension stuff, you know, any project that you do, even your own maintenance. You know, I, I worked on a project here recently about the uh, serviceability of changing the oil on one of our trucks. So um, knowing how to change your oil and having that experience is critical to doing the job well. So, um, I mean, it's great to know people, it, do your best to network, to find somebody that knows somebody that can help you get a foot in the door. But like, like James, he's very successful and didn't, you know, uh, didn't know somebody going in. I got my job at Nissan because one of my good friends was already working there. And so he helped me get the interview. So, and then when I showed up, there were two people that I knew from SAE that were already working at Nissan. So one of them interviewed me. So uh, networking, do it. Love it. Thank you. All right. This next question is from Alistair and it's for all the panelists. How do companies introduce newly graduated engineers into their employee base? How many hours do they start you with? What is expected of you? I, I want to hear a big company answer before I give my small company answer and scare people off. Well, I, I've had I've had seven jobs, and it, it just depends. I've I've actually typed this out a few times to people that it, nowadays what they they when you want to know if you are going to work forty hours a week or seventy hours a week, it's something called work life balance, and it's it's okay to talk about that now because some people want to set the world on fire and go straight to the top and. Um, you know, they don't have a family and they, you know, they don't mind those hours or have a lot of travel or anything like that. So um, it, it totally depends. Like Nissan, uh, probably thanks to the unions, uh, pays their engineers uh, for hours over 40. So, and I really end up, can I can usually work as many hours as I want to. 
but uh, typically I don't. Um, there were other jobs that were like that, but uh, sometimes you get on a salary position and you have to work until the job's done. And uh, if, if you don't like that, then uh, maybe you need to look for something else. But uh, it, it really depends on the, the position that you're in, the size of the company, you know, the, the everything. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna chime in too a little bit on on my side of things, um, and this is part of you know where I I try to, like I mentioned, really find those people that are passionate about it because um, we we tend to throw our our new hires sort of straight into the fire of figuring things out, um, and you know there I mean there's some training, but a lot of it is you know if you don't have, if you don't know to kind of to Claire's earlier point like try to, you know, ask people around you, find different resources. Um, but for the most part, uh, I, you know, I, I try to put people in positions that give them the ability to, to succeed and to, you know, really move and push things along and solve some serious problems. Yeah, so I just went through this with Texas Instruments. Um, to the work-life balance point, definitely ask, um, and this is also like why you want to intern, is that you'll get a much better idea of how long people work. Um, so I'm salary, but as of right now, I'm really only working 40 hours a week. Um, and I do own tools, so if something goes down on the factory floor in the future, I might get a call at like 2 o'clock in the morning if nobody on the shift can figure it out. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's very reasonable. Like if you work late a couple days a week, then maybe you'll get a little bit of a reprieve the previous, the following week. Um, in terms of knowledge, I came into my very first internship with, I didn't even know what a wafer was. Um, and that's like what semiconductor is based off of. Um, and so they were very, very good about teaching you what to do. Um, there's no way that you're going to learn in school, um, oh, this is what this particular photolithography tool does. And that is A-OK. -okay. Um, they, they usually understand it. And they might throw you into the fire in that they'll say, OK, here's a project. Go start working on it. Um, but they're not going to expect you to know everything. And frankly, you don't want to act like you know everything because the technicians will not be happy with you. Um, so just like go into those roles with a really open mind, um, be willing to be flexible, but nobody's just going to like, unless you lied on your resume, you're not going to be underqualified for that job. Like they're going to try very hard to make sure that that transition is good because they're spending money to get you there. Um, they spend money to hire you. They spend money to onboard you and to pay you. And if they, if you're miserable and you don't know what's going on, you're going to leave and then they're going to lose all that money and they're going to have to go through that hiring process again. So be willing to learn. Um, don't be freaked out. It might feel like a lot, but they're not going to just like totally throw you in the deep end with zero help at all. All right, um, we have a bunch of questions and unfortunately we probably won't get to all of them, but uh, the next one is from Mohammed asking, how important are the pre-engineering classes taken by freshmen and sophomores? I answered this one, uh, maybe for the first panel. Uh, I, think, I think they're critical because unlike probably a lot of majors, engineering classes build on the foundation. So, I mean, if you're struggling in, in Calc 1 and 2, then you might want to look for another major because um, you end up using all of those ideas uh, through through heat transfer, through differential equations, and, you know, it, it kind of keeps getting worse before it gets better. So uh, you need to have a, a good foundation of those things going into those higher level classes or you're just going to keep on struggling. So, um, while I, I don't think that you need to memorize everything there is to know about, about calculus, I think that you need to be comfortable with, with doing it and working on those things, you know, all along so that when your, your next class builds on that, you don't panic. Yeah, I think it's critical to some extent and not life or death on the other hand. Um, you really, really do need to get the foundation, but like, 
I would say that, it, like, not to say that you should get B's in all of your classes, but if you get B's in your classes, you probably know enough content to be okay as long as you're paying attention. Some people don't test well. Some people are really bad at, like, homework to start with. That's kind of what your freshman year is about, is you are going to fail a lot, and that is okay. Like, you shouldn't be like, oh my god, I got a C on this test. I'm like a C on a physics 2 test. I'm not going to be a good engineer. Physics 2 is not really related to your career. Um, there are some things that you'll need to know and your teachers are pretty good about like telling you that. So they'll be like, oh, this is a free body diagram. We'll use it over and over and over again. Um, you need to know how to do that. But if you get okay grades, like keep your GPA above the 3.0, do the best that you can, but don't be discouraged if you don't do perfectly your freshman year. It, you're not meant to do perfectly. You're meant to learn how to fail to some extent. Also, one real quick thing, a GPA is in no way a measure of how good an engineer you are. Just putting it out there. Or it's not even a measure of how good of a student you are. That's it. That's so real. Yeah. You're like, I graduated with like a 4.0 and A, nobody cares. Nobody has asked me about my GPA ever. And B, I guarantee you there are classes that like I could not help you with. So don't put your GPA as a measure of your self-worth, but do use it as a like general metric of how you're doing. If I can sort of add to that uh, one question that comes up about regrets is, uh, and my son is actually a computer science engineering student at uh, ASU right now. I've been encouraging him to actually try and learn what you're studying and not worry so much about what grade you get. So uh, what, for one thing, when you, you learn how to do what you're doing and try to understand it from a, a fundamental level, then once you get the homework done, you might actually be able to do the, the test questions because they're going to be slightly different. But since you really did understand it, then you, you're, you're going to do well. So that's good. But on the other hand, I mean, I don't know about the other guys, but once, once you get to work and you're working on, you know, 40 hours a week and you don't have the time and what I now think of as freedom to learn something new, you know, I, you know when I get to go to a week's training class and be away from work and just focus on learning a new idea, that's so fun and rewarding to me. So I wish I would have known that when I was in college that, hey, this is actually an incredible opportunity for me to know how stuff works. And I'm the only thing I have to do is study and learn this stuff. What an amazing opportunity that is for everyone. That's great. All right, and how about, this could be for anyone, um, what else, this comes from Wyatt, what else do you recommend learning to complement our degree and be a compelling job candidate? Please learn to talk to people. Please, please, please learn how to talk to people. That sounds very, very silly, but I, I have friends who are like amazing engineers, they're amazing at classes, they have perfect grades, and I have a friend who literally can't get a job because he cannot talk to people. He sticks his foot in his mouth every single time. Um, he's like, oh, I can't do this interview right because like I just didn't answer the, I didn't give them the right answer. And it's like, no, you just didn't have a conversation with them. So like, just because engineers are stereotyped as being awkward people, please learn to talk to people because that will set you so much farther apart than all of the other candidates. I, I was actually also gonna say communication and you took it right out of my mouth, but yes. Communication is really, really, it's really, really big. It's really, really important. Learning how to communicate an idea that you have when you're brainstorming with people or learning, like being able to listen to somebody else and understand an idea that they're trying to communicate to you. You'd be surprised how often this presents itself as a roadblock. Um, I, I go to recruiting events every semester, well, not this year yet, but, you know, and there are so many people that come up to me, they have this really nice resume, but they just cannot talk to me. And it's really hard to, you know, try to recommend them for a job or anything like that. So really, I, communication is really, really important and so understated. 
So, so keep in mind when you're interviewing, one of the last questions that the person interviewing you might ask themselves is, uh, it goes two ways. Like, would I like to have a beer with that person or would I like to go camping with that person? So when you work with someone eight hours a day and you really have nothing to talk with them about, that, that probably doesn't make you a great candidate. Also along the lines of communication, something that I think was super helpful to me was to take a personality test. The one I took was Myers-Briggs. So you have, you have, I'm an ENTJ. So now that I know that, I understand that the way I think and communicate and learn things is very different than the way a lot of other people think and communicate. Once you understand that, that there, the differences are so incredibly vast, it helps you communicate better with other people, especially that aren't engineering-like. I would like to add one last thing to that. We've all been telling you guys that communication is great and we need to be great communication. The way that you're gonna get there though, is by using all the resources that ASU provides you. And I know this for a fact because I worked at the Career Center and I was a part, an active part of all the career events. So make sure you go to all of these events and if you see some of your friends struggling with that, make sure that you take them to events. Talking to all these different people, getting, their, getting to know their perspectives will really broaden your horizon and encourage you to be a good communicator. That being said, the best way to also do it is, again, through these clubs and student organizations. And I'm sure all of us on this panel cannot stress enough on how important it is to be a part of one, two, or as many of them as you want. Thank you. Um, I think our moderator is going to take us through the end here with another question. Nikki, are you with us? Yes, I had to unmute. Sometimes I get stuck. <laughs> Thank you so much, panelists, for being here tonight. We have one more question for you before we wrap up. And um, there is just, do any of you have any parting words of wisdom? We'll start with, let's start with James this time. Let's go backwards. Sure. Um, so one thing that I think I did uh, probably different than some of the other panelists um, is I took my time going through school. Um, you know, I, I did a bachelor's. It took me six and a half years. I worked full time through that. Um, but I also tried to really, to, to Craig's point, I tried to really take the time to learn the material and not just to, to do well in tests. Um, I tried to really understand the, the processes and what they're teaching and that kind of stuff. Um, and really, when you get out to the, to the career field, I don't think anybody, you know, really cares if you, you know, got your master's at, you know, 20 years old or anything like that. I mean, yeah, that shows that you have a lot of initiative and stuff like that. But I mean, at the same time, you get to the career field when you get there. And for me, I felt like it was uh, the right decision for myself to sort of take my time, enjoy college. Um, you know, I, I thoroughly enjoyed all my time there. And uh, to echo some of the other things, you know, join a club. I did lots of them. They're lots of fun. They had profound impacts on my life, so. Thank you so much, James. Claire, I know that you just shared your, how you felt about, um, you know, being able to learn how to really speak to people, but do you have any other party words of wisdom you would like to share? Yeah, you guys can all probably tell that I could like ramble on this topic for hours. Um, <laughs> one thing that I think I wanna to touch on that hasn't really been covered um, is the pandemic. So we live in a super scary world right now. and throughout your career, throughout your college, everything that you do, there's going to be things that you have to do that you're terrified of. I can tell you for a fact that it was absolutely terrifying to pick my life up in the middle of a pandemic and move halfway across the country to a job that I didn't really have a ton of people that I knew out there. And things are going to be crazy and you don't always know what's going to happen, but like make that jump do it even if it's absolutely terrifying even if you're scared of it 
try it because the worst that can happen is you stick your two years in your job and you just go home. There's never going to be a situation that you can't get out of. So do the crazy thing. Go join that club. Uh, go move across the country, um, even if it's scary. That's all. Thank you. And there is a question in here for you about the four plus one program. Do you feel like it gave you an advantage over other candidates? Um, so I did it after I had already done my internship. Uh, what I will say is it's very, very useful if you are not 100% sure what industry you want to go into. Um, in terms of like job offers, I know for a fact I would have gotten a job offer with just an undergrad at the same exact company doing the same exact job. Um, that being said, I did get like a $10,000 raise for having a master's and I only spent one year in school. Um, so it, I'm not going to say it made me stand out more than other candidates, but it, it didn't, it certainly didn't hurt. Wow, that's really good information. Thank you so much. All right, Ganesh, how about you? Do you have some parting words for us? I do. And there's one underlying message that it can sort of be found in all the pieces of advice that we've been giving you this evening. And that is to get out of your comfort zone. I think all the things that Claire mentioned, all the things that James mentioned, all of these things can be possible if you learn to be comfortable with yourself as a person, as an engineer, as as whatever you want to call it, be comfortable with yourself rather than your surroundings. And the best way to do that as you're getting through university is to get out of your comfort zone and explore as, ma as many things as you can, try to get into as many different situations as you can, try to meet as many new people as you can in your four years or five or how many ever years it is you're spending at ASU. But make sure to take that leap and that's gonna get your minds. Thank you. Appreciate that. And probably it goes back to that same thing that Claire and Diola talked about with that being able to, if you're getting out there and you're meeting a lot of people, then you are learning how to communicate. Um, Diola, uh, there is another question here for you too. And then if you could give us your parting words, but I see a question that's asking, you mentioned that the pacing of your work sometimes is, um, is difficult and I, I'm, let's, I'm going to read this exactly how it's written. Um, you mentioned pacing when explaining the work environment. By that do you mean is it hard to keep up with? Um, it can be overwhelming. So I remember uh, when I, because I, I did an internship first and then I returned full time and when I first started with my internship I remember myself and all the interns were just really exhausted because coming from classes where you had breaks in between, you get to walk from one class to the other, work kind of felt nonstop, you were just going. Um, so in terms of the pace like that, it can be exhausting. Um, I am a person where I have, I'm always willing to help people and so that can be overwhelming in terms of taking on too much at one at, at one time. So that's something where you have to know yourself and how much you can and, handle. And don't be like me, underestimating how long it will actually take to complete a task. <laughs> um, so yes, it, it can be a lot, but you can also learn to take things one at a time that it was emphasized to me many times when my manager finished one thing before we do the other, but I said yes, and then I did the exact opposite. So don't do that. Um, in terms of parting words, um, what I would say is don't be afraid to fail and don't be afraid to own up to your mistakes. Um, I've made a lot of mistakes uh, just in working, um, just things that I reported on and very often I had to come back and say, no, nope, that data I shared was not entirely correct. Let me backtrack a little bit. Um, just 
everybody makes mistakes, know that, um, regardless of where you are in your career. So just learn how to take responsibility for that and own up to that because it's easier to move forward that way. It's easier to find somebody who's going to help you do it better, help you become better. The end. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Craig, um, you'll be our final one and then we are going to uh, hear from Claire. Again, she's going to share some contact information, but Craig, there is one question in here. It's a curious question. A student says, as a fan of Nissan Z platform, I was very excited to see the prototype for the next generation Z. Were you involved in that project in any way? And then in your parting words for us, please. I saw it across the garage. Uh, it was the, the powertrain was installed in an older Z. So I knew that it was twin turbo and I knew that there was a manual offered, but I didn't know anything else about it. A lot of uh, the GTR and Z and a lot of the Infinity programs are developed in Japan. So a very limited amount of development work goes on for that in, in the US, unfortunately. But I'm sure I'll get to drive it at some point. So that'll be cool. <laughs> um, parting words, I guess. Uh, I've been reading a, a lot of the questions and it seems like a lot of you are wondering if engineering is the right thing for you or you know how did you stay motivated to uh, to continue as an engineer um, just general maybe doubt I'll, I'll tell you what happened to me um, I knew that when I was in school that I was probably studying maybe twice as hard as the my friends and uh, spending a lot more time in Noble library than they were and uh, so I thought about changing and I couldn't really think of anything else that I wanted to do. So I didn't. And fact is that was a good decision for me. So um, I, I think that engineering has very good stability. I think that the pay is above average, but maybe not as much as you might think. Uh, I think that uh, there's a lot of opportunity. I think that the work life balance is a lot of times pretty good. Um, I, you know, I'm grateful for the position that I'm in right now and the time I've got to spend with my family. So, uh, however, most of those friends that were out at any coin, any drink when I was at home studying were make more money than I do. So um, if, if that's really your intention and you want to uh, to make a lot of money and, and really aren't afraid to to go after it, then engineering may not might not be the best thing for you. So. Um, especially if I like I said if you're really struggling with the, the entry-level classes so uh, don't be afraid to look around don't be afraid to change your mind um, my girlfriend right now has had so many different careers and then ended up being a doctor starting from when she was 45 so um, I know that 30 seems very old when you're in your 20s but uh, at, at 50 I'm, I'm still learning and still have a lot of opportunity and a lot of things to look forward to so uh, I would encourage you to take a look at other majors if you think that you maybe you should and uh, to have an open mind. So good luck to you. Well, thank you so much, Craig. Claire, did you want to share your contact information with the students? Yeah, so I said to be brave. Uh, I'll, I'll leave you with this. Um, on LinkedIn, my name is Arminta Claire Jordan. If you search Claire Jordan, you'll probably find me as well. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, and I love all of these questions, so you're always welcome to ask me questions, but do something crazy. Go connect with me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. On behalf of the Fulton Schools of Engineering, I would like to thank the panelists for their time and their insight. Students, uh, be sure to take the Career Exploration Night Survey, which is on page three of your workbook, and the recording will be available in a couple of days through your ASU 101 course. And then everybody can go ahead and log out of the webinar now. Thank you so much and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>